Okay, so we're going to tell you about testing and intelligent feedback and why you should do it yourself. Uh, I'm Sergio Silva. I'm, I'm a software engineer at OutSystems. This is Diogo Oliveira, also a software engineer at OutSystems. So let's get started. By show of hands, who knows who this is? Okay. This is Linus Torvalds. He's the principal de uh, developer and creator of the Linux kernel, which is a big piece of software. And um, he has some really nice uh, thoughts about refactoring and version control systems, at least he had in the beginning when he was a developer. Something like this. And he really doesn't care about people. He cares about technology and the kernel. And that's really all that's important to him. And still on refactoring, he doesn't really think it helps. He, he practically thinks it, it's the devil of, of software development. But um, back in his day, he had no version control. Uh, he had like hardcore system level uh, programming, uh, code reviews on a mailing list, patch requests on his email inbox, some interesting discussions on mailing lists too, like on software design. Involve, it, it usually involved uh, talking about stuff about people's moms, usually, and really no refactoring and no reusing code. And he relied on his ability a lot. So he was really smart. He was a big part of, of, of the development of a huge piece of software, which today is now like 15 million lines of code. And he should. He's really, he's really smart. And he usually did, did things in one go. But eventually, some people started to not like it. And this particular email, I don't know if, if, you, if you've read it, from a guy named Eric S. Raymond, uh, a famous software developer, he called him out and said, he really doesn't know what it is for mere mortals to work to get to where he is. So he eats, he eats uh, Linux kernels for, for breakfast. And he said he suffered from a condition which is the curse of the gifted. And the curse of the gifted, I'm sure you met someone uh, during high school, for example, like those kids that don't need to study and just take the tests and get awesome grades. They don't really need to study because it's just, they just understand stuff. It's just an innate ability. But then when things start to get uh, tougher, like in college, things don't really go so well because they, they couldn't get a method for studying or to validate that what they were reading or learning about was, was valid. And so, not, not everything is bad, and Linus eventually wised up and ended up creating a piece of software that I'm sure none of you know about. And even though he worked mainly alone, he needed version control. So that says a lot about him. But why are we talking about this? Well, at our company, at OutSystems, we do it too. So we had the same problem, but we're here to tell you that you can avoid it when you're developing your product. So in our case, we had this problem, but not because we're geniuses like Linus, we don't develop kernels for breakfast, but we had a, a, a really tough problem uh, in the beginning with testing. And testing was something that was done only when a problem was reported by a client. And we didn't really have unit tests, and tests were just like a, attaching a test application to an issue uh, that belonged to support, and then whenever we needed to validate if that bug was fixed or not, we needed to open the, the application, publish, and then check if everything was okay. So not a really good way to work. And when it wasn't enough, we invented our, our own tools for, for testing. And we obviously thought it was a perfect solution because it was built using uh, our own product, our own uh, platform. So, uh, back in our days, we were a small team. Uh, we had a small product, and we had no tests. This is the way we worked. <laughs> so, how did how did he test stuff? Um, it 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 soon started to to become more complex. So we we needed to start supporting multiple operating systems, like Windows and Linux. And then we had to support multiple databases, and then multiple programming languages for the back end, multiple rendering technologies at, at the time, and then browsers, you know, JavaScript, CSS, all the variety. So we invented our own regression testing tool. And it was something that built our entire code base, our entire platform, installed it, and then automatically run tests. We started writing some unit tests, and this did it automatically 
um, whenever we want it. So it was handmade by us. We used the platform, and for us, it was easy to change, it was easy to deploy, and it was really, believe me, it was better than anything else at that time. This was uh, perhaps 10 years, 15 years ago. But it's ended up being our curse. So eventually, it, it solved the problem. It continued to solve it for a long time, thanks to people with high pain resistance. And it was the only thing that gave us the green light to ship whatever we're developing. So it was, it was kind of like a, uh, a holy figure that said, OK, you, you can ship it or you can't, because some test is failing. And eventually, it also tested too much. So the, the, uh, our product is huge. It has a lot of variables. So eventually, we started reaching the thousands of tests mark. And this ended up being a really slow process. And it, evol it was evolved by everyone at the organization. So whenever people got in and wanted to change this piece of software, they did it, didn't ask for any validation. So we didn't have a clear vision of what this tool was for, really. And we didn't really stop to think about it. We, it, it continuously evolved. It, ended up doing a lot of stuff, perhaps stuff that wasn't really needed or could be done with another piece of software or in a different stage. And in the end, we had a 26-hour wait time to run every test. Um, it, we had dozens of different, different machines, different operating systems, different stacks, all that <laughs> variable. And we had unstable tests and documented tests, and it was really too big to change. Everyone was afraid to delve into the code or in, into the data model and then start changing stuff. But fast forward 15 years, our systems still exists and we're still able to deliver stuff. We, we don't have to wait 26 hours now. Uh, but now we have close to 100, 130 people just in engineering. Uh, we have many branches. Uh, the product is even huge, even bigger. Uh, we have clients building critical stuff. And we have close to 12,000 tests. So this is not slowing down. We really had to change something, and that's what Diogo is going to tell you about. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I don't know if the mic is OK or not. Probably I can talk near this one. So um, at this point, something had to change. Uh, we, uh, our problem was getting worse. So that regression tool that Sergio talked about, it was being developed for a lot of different people. and. It was becoming unmanageable because we started, it started to grow a lot and we, we didn't, didn't have a clear vision for it. And more than that, uh, the number of developers we had increased a lot at this point. And this uh, made the problem even worse because we were having more commits, more people uh, playing with that tool. So clearly, at this point, we needed to do something. So what did we do? So, now fasten your seatbelts because we are going in a journey of our journey of change. And where did we start to, to change stuff? So we started by our testing infrastructure. And why did we do this? So uh, to give you some context before, apart from all that regression tool stuff and the 26 hours uh, uh, hours to, to run tests, we also had another problem, which was Imagine a developer needed a machine for tests for a new stack. And he usually asked, OK, so I need a new machine to run my tests. And the ops guy would say, OK, so let me just go to our infrastructure department, ask them a machine. And eventually, in two weeks, I will have the machine. And after having it, I will spend three days configuring it using our 49 pages long manual. And this is true. We had really a 49 pages long manual to provision a machine. It, 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 it had documentation for several stacks. That's why it was so long. But still, it was very painful. And more than that, since the provisioning of the machines was a very manual process, we used to say that our, our testing machines were like snowflakes. So they were, each of them was very unique and very sensible. So we needed to really take care of them very well. So what did we do? Let's, let's automate this. And we started by automating the provisioning of our test environment. Um, and we, for this, we use Chef, which has, uh, I don't know if you are familiar or not with it, but Chef has, has Ruby language behind it. And basically, what Chef allows you to do, very simply, is to have your infrastructure as code. So before people, every time you had new requir requirements for the testing machines, a developer needed to go to a document, update the document, and someone review the document, and whatever. 
now the the infrastructure provisioning is, is code itself, so it's much easier to, to change. So what did we solve with this at this point? So we saved three around three days of one person that were spent manually creating uh, machines, which was a very repetitive work and very tedious for the person that was doing it. And as I was saying, it was much easier for developers to change the, the configurations because it's code after all. Okay, this is very cool, <coughs> but we still had a problem. So uh, our machine configurations were now automated, which is very cool, but we still ne needed to wait for someone to give us the machine first before we, we actually configured it. This was something also very painful for us because we were not, we could not create machines and testing environments independently. We were always dependent on someone to create a machine. And then the guys that create the machines had backlog, other machines to create, so it was something not, not that cool. So once again, we needed to do something. So we decided to, I hope everyone here is familiar with Dragon Ball, because we, we decided to create, let's, let's give a call to, to Master Roshi and ask him, hey man, do you, do you still have one of those flying Nimbus that you, that you gave to Dragon Ball? So that guy offered Dragon Ball a Nimbus so, so that he was able to fly. And this is what we needed at this point. So what we did was with this, the Nimbus project was born. This was the name that we give to our project, which basically was a project that we did to move our infrastructure to the, to the cloud. So that we were not dependent anymore on internal creation of machines and manual creation. Uh, and for these, we used uh, EC2 and RDS uh, services from, from Amazon. So what did we get with this? We, we had the machine provisioning much faster than we had before. We, at the beginning, were able to have a, f a fully automated provisioning process for one of our supported stacks. Uh, those machines were much easier to recover because now they were not snowflakes anymore. We could just throw the machine away and create another one if needed. Uh, they were reliable and, and performant, and they were also scalable, so they would give us the ability to scale when we need. Sorry, just a second. Uh, okay, and to give you an idea on, on the difference of scale that we have now, so instead of having two or three weeks uh, from the machine request to the machine completion now, with this process, once uh, anyone requests a machine, it takes like one hour for the machine to be created and up and running, which is something very different and was very important for us. So, but now you can ask, so you started talking about the test and the 26 hours, how, how did you, what did you do about it? So, that's a great question. Uh, we did once uh, a brown bag. I, I don't know if all of you are familiar with the term, but a brown bag is a, a kind of presentation that is usually doing uh, done during lunchtime. That's why it's called a brown bag, because people usually grab brown bags with food. And we decided to, to tell to the company what was continuous delivery, uh, why did we need continuous delivery, and why we were not on continuous delivery at this time. This was something that had a huge impact on, on our developers, and we were not expecting that. We were just sharing knowledge, but turns out that people really heard what is, is, we said. And just also to give some context, continuous delivery, for those who don't know, is a, this is one of the many definitions, but it's a software development discipline where you the software we are, you are building should be released uh, very often in, and it should be I ideally releasable at any time. So some of its characteristics are, for example, it's deployable through its life cycle. Um, team prioritizes keeping it stable instead of making new features. Um, it relies on, on fast and automated feedback. And you have aut automation of, of your release process. This, this is an... Uh, this definition is adapted from Martin Fowler's website. You, you can follow the link, then we will share the presentation if you want to read what he thinks about this. But now getting back to the huge impact, so the impact of this was the following. So some of our developers, uh, by their own initiative, went to their managers and, and they said, these are our developers, and they said, hey, we are re really excited about this continuous delivery stuff. So if you give us one week, we, will, we promise that we will save you three months of its effort. And so the manager said, okay, go for it, do that. And 
in that week th those guys created something that we called Cynthia <coughs> which stands for uh, continuous integration and intelligent alert system which um, the developers that created it and Sergio was one of them initially called it a monkey and why a monkey because it, it was something that was doing monkey work and automated work that people were doing before by end so the Cynthia when it was created it was something that automated the builds of the platform incremental builds now on the regression system we had before we were always making full builds which took a, lot of, a long time automated platform installations we started by adding a couple of automated tests, only 1,000 to start. Uh, automatic assign to, to write culprits, I will explain this after. But basically, when someone broke a test, we were able to understand who was the person or the people responsible for breaking the test. And we, to develop Cynthia, we used our own product to develop the UI part, and then everything that was the orchestration of the, the build system and testing was done in Python at this point. So this was the, the, the UI of the, our first Cynthia. So as you can see, you have the, the current build that is being processed and the time that it started to being processed. Uh, you have the build and install status. On this case, they are green. And then you have a list of tests that are failing uh, with their execution times and the faces of people. So as you can see, in the down left, this guy is, is breaking tests there. So this was, was a, a very big change for us at this point because we were before running tests only on nightlies or weeklies, so it was very hard to understand who was the person responsible for breaking anything. We would have to analyze the code and revisions and check, oh, it wasn't me, it was that guy. So this was really a big thing for us at this point. But so just to sum it up, at this point we had the build installation and 1,000 tests in the round. Uh, 19 minutes, and this was automatically triggered by, by commits, so no, no need to, to, uh, to manual processes here. We had fast feedback, and we had that automa automatic culprit assign, and we had it fast, which was something very important for us and, and very cool. But okay, now you might think, but this is all very cool, 19 minutes, but you talked about 12,000 tests, you only have 1,000, so that's not very strange. So can't we add more tests? Yeah, we can add more tests to this, but we wanted to start Cynthia as a small stuff. It was a, a prototype, it was a proof of concept, let's say. And now let's improve and let's work on it. So, but by adding more tests, aren't we falling again on that 26 hours uh, turnaround time we had before? So, okay, keep calm. We, we've done something to, to work this out. So, as you can see here, the, the UI of Cynthia now is a little different than it was at the first point. And what we did here was we basically created three test stages. Instead of having all the tests in the same bag as we had before, we created three different stages that represent three different confidence levels of tests. And thus, they have different feedback cycle times. So for example, the tests that are on the first stage execute in 10 minutes, and, and they are tests that are more core for the, the functionality of our product, for example. So if you break any of these 1,000 tests, you, you have to stop and fix these and you can't keep working. Then the second, um, the second stage would run in half an hour and the third one in, in one hour and a half, something like that. To achieve these times, we also used some parallelization. So before all the tests were executed, <coughs> they were not parallelized and they were executed sequentially on the same machine. Now we have several machines to, to do this job. So very cool. But you also mentioned about uh, unstable tests. Uh, um, unstable tests on, on our particular case are tests that sometimes fail for wrong reasons. So it, they are tests that fail and then you retry and they, they pass. And usually that, that has to do with, for example, tests that are testing the UI and that, that are very sensible to the timing of that the elements appear and stuff like that. So to give awareness of these unstable tests to our developers so that they could fix them, we did something. So what we did was we implemented a mechanism to automatically detect the, the, the unstable tests. And you can see there by that, that red circle, the tests that are uh, marked as unstable are, are have a dice near the test so people can know that they have 
random results. Um, and this was very important because people really understood in which tests they needed to spend time uh, looking at the results and which tests needed to be refactored or, or even deleted if they were not needed. So this is very cool, but now my test is failing. I, I need to know why. Do I need to go to the, to the environment where the test is executing to understand what's happening? So we also did something to solve this. So what we did was we implemented a mechanism that, that had centralized test history. So on that uh, Cynthia UI, if, if you click on the name of a test, you can see the filler message, the stack trace, and also the, um, and also you can understand the test environment where the test executed, which was very important. And we have we had everything in the same place. And so now, what about the parallelization? So, if any machine misbehaves or or goes down, how do we know what's happening? Uh, so. Have you heard about Slack? Probably everyone here had. So what we did was we used Slack for our internal communications. And what we did was integrating the, the monitoring of this system with Slack. So we have <laughs> automatic notifications for this. And yeah, very cool. So now let's check the actual numbers of where we, are, we were before and where we are now. So before we, this was like two years ago, more or less. We had 12,000 tests that were executing in 26 hours, something like that. Um, and more than that, some tests were executed once per day. So they were only executed once per day at night. And other tests were only executed uh, once every week. Now, what changed is that now on this uh, Cynthia system, we have 8,000 tests that run in around one hour and a half, something like that. And they are executed many times a day. So they are being triggered automatically by commits. So we get feedback much faster than we had before. If you are wondering where did the 4,000 missing tests go, so we didn't delete the tests. What we did was those tests were tests that were made by a, a DSTL that we created once again inside the company. And we, <coughs> they are still running on the old system, but we are encouraging people to refactor them and create new tests that can be executed here, and people have been doing that a lot. So this was very cool at this point. We were very happy. We were finally having fast feedback. And we were finally getting away from our old legacy system. But now wait a bit. We started this talk uh, talking about creating things your own and doing the wrong thing. So aren't we doing the same thing again? And aren't we reinventing the wheel? Well, we think we are not, and we have several reasons for this. One of them is we are now building this system based on well-known open source tools. So everything that's orchestrated behind the curtains, let's say, it's, is done with GoCD, which is a continuous delivery platform that is made by ThoughtWorks. Uh, we have been doing a lot of research on, on creating build pipelines and, and fast feedback validation systems. And, and see what's being done out there on big companies and stuff like that. And <coughs> more than that, we are constantly focusing on, on trying to improve what we have. And more important than that, we are constantly questioning ourselves why are we doing something. And for example, the reason for us to create this UI and not use a, a system that already exists, for example, like Yankins or whatever, is that we really felt the need to have a a very fast and simple way to see, OK, I, I made this commit and I broke this test. And I have my first there. This is simple to understand. I don't need to na navigate through Yankin's UI and find where is. So this was just a, a UI, uh, let's say, customization. So some lessons learned that we, that we had during this journey and that is something that will keep on with us. So, the first thing is that the one-size-fits-all solution usually doesn't exist. So there are companies that use some kind of build pipeline and think that systems that are very good for them, but that probably are not good for you. So you should really try to understand what fits for, for your purpose. You should do what you need the way you need when you, have the, when you really need to do it. Um, and you, if you have a problem, do something for it. Don't, don't wait for the managers. To, to tell you to do something, try to do like these guys did and ask a week, 
to, to implement a revolutionary system that will change the way you work. But uh, I'll ask question why we, you are doing it and if you really need to do it and if you are doing it the right way. Um, I always try to grow from established ideas. This is something we also learn. So we build our own stuff, but we researched a lot about what was there already so that we could make sure that we were not reinventing the wheel. And something very important, and, and coming back to the where Sergio started, never think you are too good to, to see what's out there and never try to do things yourself if you don't have a very valid reason, reason to do that. So that's it. Thank you for, for coming for our presentation. Serves you and me again, and if you if you need to reach us, there are our contacts. And now, if you have questions, we are available for you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No? Actually, I have one question. You, you there in the re test results, you have three type of results, right? The the past, the failed, and the unstable. Is that yes. correct? What do you do with the, with the unstable ones? Well, uh, can, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, what, what we do with the unstable ones is just, uh, by the way, one, one important detail. Uh, the UI that Diogo was showing, we have that on a TV 24-7. Okay, yeah. so whenever, whenever we change something in the code, we get immediate feedback of what happens, and unstable tests appear first. So unstable ones, uh, when they fail, will appear first, and that causes us to uh, take a look at them and try to make them better. And that's something that we didn't really need to enforce. People just, you know, with the a social pressure of having their face on screen with the unstable mark on it, people feel uh, compelled to improve them. And we actually, we, we have decreased a lot uh, our unstable uh, test base. Thanks to this, uh, we also in the start we also had um, some some information still still over there about the test duration because we had tests that took forever to run. Uh, they they could be really simple, but they needed to do a lot of things or too much. And because we had the time, we need we could see when where we were wasting time in the build pipeline. So because we want this to be fast, slow tests couldn't exist, and so. Since this is our product, and since we value this, uh, and not you know the first tool, we we actually feel the need to make stuff go faster. It it, it it's actually the most remarkable part of, of developing this system is that it changed the way we we think about tests and the way we develop tests. So so you assume that the uh, unstable problem is due to the code of the test. Is that it? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? The, when you see unstable, uh, you assume that the problem is in the coding of the test. Is that it? Well, if it, if it, 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 could, it could be, it couldn't be. But uh, sometimes other tests misbehave and mess up the tests that run uh, next. Uh, but thankfully, Diogo and the guys from his team uh, actually gave us the right tools to do some, to do some debugging and, take, and, and see what is the execution uh, context for that test to know what ran before and if the test was not really contained enough so that they messed up the environment and thanks to that we if, even even if this test isn't a problem we fix the other ones we have all the tools we need to 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 troubleshoot the problem okay thanks thank you hi Go my ahead. question is quite simple how do you test the test platform? Do you test it using itself? So we, that's a good question. I didn't talk about it. But we are currently dog fooding, so we are using our own test platform to test itself. So we created tests that run over it. I didn't show that part here, but we are doing it. So we have a lot of tests done in Python, and we have others that are done using the platform itself. Basically, we use this same system to run those tests. So we are dogfooding for doing that, which we thought was a good idea, and that I think it's a good idea. That's it. Any further questions? No? Thank you. 
Okay, so thank you guys for coming.